Well, good morning. About three months ago, we passed out a card that had questions on it, and we had people number what they wanted or write in what they uh, uh, wanted to learn about or had questions about. So we're going to start this series, and uh, if you ask for it, if you need sermon notes, wave at me. And uh, this, this sermon's about what happens when you die. One of the most important things you need to establish in your heart. You know, the most dangerous people in the world are those who aren't afraid to die. You can turn me down just a little bit, Brad, because when I yell, it echoes. So that's, you know, you don't need to be afraid to die. Christians should not be afraid to die. In the class this morning, it was said, we are here, to, we're just visitors. Come on. This is not our home. This is not forever. Forever's heaven. And yeah, it's in you not to want to die. It's in you. For someone to kill themselves, they're under an influence that's not God. Okay? And, and, and so what we need to understand is that there is life after death on this earth. So, so we've talked about it. You're a spirit. You have a soul. And you have a body. When your spirit leaves your body, your body dies, and it could be in perfect health. Huh? So you need to understand that your spirit and your soulical man will live forever. Your soul is your memory. You know, don't answer, but two plus two is four. He answered four. Where did he learn that? You put that in your soul, and you remember it, and you learn it, so you learn how to add, subtract. And all these things. So, so we're going to dig in. You know, David said it this way, and then Joshua said it the same way. Uh, on his deathbed, David said, I go the way of the earth. I'm going the way of the earth. Death is the last enemy that will be put asunder. Death is the last enemy. And so and it's appointed unto man once to die. So we're all going to die unless we're caught up with Jesus in the rapture. And then the Bible says in a moment and a twinkling of an eye, a metaphor for one quarter of a second, you're going to be changed and you're going to be taken to heaven. Smile at somebody said, I'm going. Come on. So, you know, we're talking about a little bit about heaven and we're going to talk a little bit about hell. But I'm not going to hell, I'm going to heaven. Well, how do you know? Because his spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God. Amen, amen. So and that's what I want you to have today, that you know that you know that you're a child of God. Uh, Hebrews 9.27, I already quoted it, it's appointed unto man once to die. So let's go to number one, because I got a lot of information, and we're going to uh, look at a lot of stuff today. There is life after death. Now, Jesus told this story. Now, Jesus told a lot of parables that the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a fig tree or likened unto a man going to a far country. You know, there are likened to's and metaphors, and he taught parables to help people understand the Word of God. But this is not a parable. This is a true story. Because he said there was a certain rich man. He's getting specific. And so this is a true story, and let's read it. In Luke 16, 19, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day, living high on the hog, as they say in the mountains. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom, the rich man also died and was buried. I'm going to stop right there. What was buried in the ground? His body. Okay? We're going to show you some things. His body was buried in the ground. Both of them's body. One was in a pauper's grave. One was in a, a probably a nice, you know, they didn't have caskets, but a nice tomb. Okay? You with me? Okay? And it has nothing to do with the rich man being rich. The rich man trusted his own riches and his own power instead of God. Now, where was the Lazarus taken, poor man taken to Abraham's bosom? Abraham's bosom was right above hell. And as we're going to read this, it's not there anymore. And we'll explain just in a little bit. And so uh, the rich man in verse 23, and being in torment in hell or Hades, he lifted up his eyes. This is the rich man and saw Abraham afar off. And Lazarus in his bosom. 
Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented. So we're going to stop right there. Finger, tongue, but wait a minute. His body's buried in a tomb. But he still had fingers. His spirit man still had fingers, had eyes, and that he saw... Lazarus, and he knew Abraham. Abraham had died a thousand years before. I don't know how long ago, but he didn't know Abraham when he was on the earth. The Bible says that when we get to heaven, we're going to be known as we are known. You can look at somebody and say, Denise, and have never met him before. That's pretty cool. And so he saw Abraham and knew it was Abraham and recognized Abraham even in hell. Now, We'll finish the story, but I wanted to point that out. You still have a look about you. You know, my dad passed away, but I figured that he looks like he was, was when he was 23. Not when he died and was still sick and, and this and that and the other. No, 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 no. He can outrun me. Okay? So, you know, heaven's a wonderful place. I always used to teach the kids, talk about it's got a lake, sea, river of life. Don't matter if you can swim or not. You can't drown in the river of life. It's the river of life. Come on. There's mountains. So how do you really describe heaven? It's like another planet. Except there's light continuously. God's there. Amen? And so so let's, let's finish this story. And Abraham said in verse 25, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. Uh, And besides all this, between us, there's a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor those who uh, from there pass to us. And then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father. And listen to what he said. This is in his soul. He's in hell. He has a spirit, but he also has a soul. And this is in his soul. Okay. I have five brothers. Send Lazarus, but let me back up to 27. I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one raised or be raised from the dead or rise from the dead. Let's just, let me give you that example. The children of Israel came out of Egypt. You with me? They came out of slavery. Uh, uh, the, The plagues didn't affect them. They went through the Red Sea. Miracle. Fire kept Pharaoh's army back. Miracle. They had a fire at night. They had a cloud by day. They're walking in the shade every day. They had miracle to water come out of the rock. They had manna fall from the sky. Didn't change them. Their shoes and clothes lasted forever. Just You just pointed out. But did not change them. Miracles won't change you. Yes, I believe in miracles. Yes, we can have miracles. But that's not where miracles, you don't just, oh God, if you give me a miracle, I'll serve you. No, you serve him and miracles come. You believe in him first. And that's what this story is about. But in hell, he remembered every opportunity he could have served God. And he remembered his brothers were just like him. That's horrible. Hell's a horrible place. So, Brother Hagin, you say there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And you better be running from hell as far and as fast as you can. And the only way to, to miss it, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only one that died so you could be washed of your sins. You know, in the Old Testament, they sacrificed animals so that they could be covered, not washed. You know, the first covering was in the garden. When Adam and Eve sinned, they put fig leaves on. You know, fig leaves ain't going to last. They're going to dry up and they're going to fall off. They're going to be, they're not going to, God killed animals and covered them. Gave them clothing, but that was the first offering for sin. Those innocent animals died for their sin to cover them. But thank God Jesus came to die on a cross for us, not to cover us, but to wash us. 
and that we believe in Him, then we are washed by His blood and we, we can stand before God clean. So quit looking at your sin and start looking at Jesus and then get washed in the blood today and settle it once and for all. Amen? Amen, amen. amen. All right. So, so as we look at this, uh, just that, so, so when you die, believer, you're going to go to heaven and you're going to stand before judgment. But wait a minute. It's not the great white throne of judgment. There's two judgments. The great white throne of judgment, we're going to meet this man and see this man and probably stand before God, the one that's in hell, and he's going to be judged for his sin. But I just said, your sins have been washed away. You're not going to stand for your sins. You're going to stand for what you should have, could have done for God while you were alive on the earth. You know, the things that haunt me are not that I prayed with this young girl. Uh, uh, we went out to eat. It was, she's 18, just graduated. It was her first uh, job, first table she'd ever waited on. Just having to get me. Man, I prayed for her and that God would bless her in her new job. And that, you know, those things are fun. But you know what? I missed the opportunity when a tire fell off the truck. And I pulled up in a gas station and this girl, her windshield was tore out. And, and, and God said, give her some money, and I didn't. That's what haunts me. That what I could have done to help somebody, what I should have done. You know, and that's where we need our boldness to, to, to show the love of God. Amen? And I have done some loving things begrudgingly before, too. You know, I've good clothes and crawled under a car and fixed the car before. You know, do what you got to do. Change the flat. And so here, here we go. I, I, I'm going to read some, uh, some stuff. And listen, I, I'm not, I, I was preached at when I was a kid, and, and they preached hell so hot, you thought the preacher was from there. <laughs> he knew what he was talking about. But your shoes start melting, and, and you're sweating, and, and they're trying to put fear in you. And yes, we need to fear. We need to respect God. But we're gonna, I'm going to read some last words of some atheists and unbelievers and agnostics. And, it's little, and, it's, and I'm not trying to scare you into heaven, but you need to hear some of this stuff. Y'all ready? Anton LaVey. He wrote the Satanic Bible, high priest to a religion dedicated worship of Satan. In his dying words, oh my, oh my, what have I done? There's something very wrong. There is something very, very wrong. Sir Thomas Scott. Chancellor of England, until this moment, I thought there was neither a God nor a hell. Now I know and feel that there are both, and I am doomed, doomed to, to hell by, ju by the just judgment of the Almighty. Wow. Thomas Hobbes, political philosopher, I say again, if I had the whole world at my disposal, I would give it to live one day. I'm about to take a leap into the dark. Voltaire, famous anti-Christian atheist, I have swallowed nothing but smoke. I have intoxicated myself with the incense that turned my head. I'm abandoned by God and man. He said to his physician, Dr. Foshan, I will give you half of what I'm worth if you will give me six months of life. And when he was told it was not possible, he said, then I shall die and go to hell. And his nurse said, for all the money in Europe, I would not want to see another unbeliever die. For all night long, he cried. Wow, wow, huh? David Hume, atheist philosopher, famous for his philosophy of empiricism and skepticism and of religion, he cried loud on his deathbed, I am in flames. I am in flames. And he said his desperation was a horrible scene. Charles IX, the French king, urged by his mother to give the order for the massacre of the French Huguenots, in which 15,000 souls were slaughtered in Paris alone and 100,000 in other sections of France for no other reason that they loved Jesus. The guilty king suffered miserably for years after that event. He finally died and bathed in blood bursting from his veins. To his physicians, he said in his last hours, asleep or awake, I see all the Huguenots passing before me. 
that I, and he said, that I would have spared at least some of the infants on their mother's bosom. I know not where I am. How will all this end? What shall I do? I am lost forever. I know it. Oh, I've done wrong. And this is the last one I'm going to read. I got some more. But Joseph Stalin, Soviet Georgian revolutionary politician, one of the most evil men to ever rule. In Newsweek interview with Svetlin Stalin, his daughter, she told of her father's death. My father died a difficult and terrible death. God grants an easy death only to the just. At what seemed very, at the very last moment, he suddenly opened his eyes, cast a glance over the room. It was a terrible glance, an insane glance, and perhaps angry. His left hand was raised as though he was pointing to something and bringing down a curse on us all. His gesture was a full menace. The moment, and then in a moment, he was dead. Even Gandhi, I am going to read the last one. If you've heard of Gandhi, man of peace, a man that was nice. Niceness don't get you in heaven. It's the blood of Jesus. At his death, he said, for the first time in 50 years, I find myself in a slew of despond. All about me is darkness. All about me is darkness. I'm praying for light. Psalms 14, 1, a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So there is a heaven to gain and a hell to run from. Let's go to number two. As Christians, we should have hope. Come on. If Jesus rose again, I'm just going to throw this out there, getting ahead here, but Jesus rose again. Guess what? So will we. So will we. And, and we're going to talk about some things, and I even have a video, so, so stay with me on this. I'm going to read this in, in, in the New American Standard. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep or have died, so that you will not grieve as indeed the rest of mankind who have no hope. Come on. If you're in here today and you've lost a loved one, they're not lost. If they passed or died, they're not lost. They're in heaven. I don't care if it was a, a baby that was aborted or a baby that was miscarried or if a, a three-year-old passed away, they're not lost. They're in heaven. Grandma and grandpa passed away. They're not in heaven. They're, they're not lost. They're in heaven. It's a change of address. And every child that's in heaven, guess what? They're there going to be there to greet you. Hey, talking about reunion, reunited. And, and guess who they were going to be in the earth? That's who they're going to be in heaven. The dreams and hopes you may have had for that child, God had dreams and hopes for that child too. And they're going to fulfill that, those in, in eternity. The Bible says not only we, we're not going to go to heaven and float on a cloud and play a harp. You know? No, we're going from glory to glory. Why do you think there's a, a, a solar system? Why do you think there's universe is here? I'm just saying. We're going from glory to glory. And God's going to teach us and show us things. And guess what? We're going to be like Jesus. I'm ready to be like Jesus. Just look at what Jesus did after he was raised from the dead. You're going to be like Jesus. Not going to be an angel. I don't want to, I, you know, I hate to bust your bubble. A lot of people think we're going to be angels. You're not getting angels' wings where you can fly off. You're just going to be able to ascend. And you're going to be able to disappear and walk into a room and eat. You're going to get to eat. I know y'all thinking, well, uh, I know you like to eat. I like to eat too. We're going to eat in heaven. The Bible, that's why I say you got a place at the table, Christian. We're going to have a marriage supper of the Lamb. I did, we did a wedding yesterday, and we sat down at a big, long table. And man, we had some good food. We're going to have good food in heaven. Okay? We just think, oh, we're just going to float around and play a harp and sing something, you know. No. We're going to enjoy ourselves. But there are also things to do. We're going to have responsibilities. How about if God sends you back to Virginia? Huh? He might. To fulfill your purpose for Virginia. All right, all right. So, so where were we at? Let's keep reading. I'm not, sorry, I'm getting off here. We don't want you to be uninformed. Uh, in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead... 
so also God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. For we say this to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive who remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So comfort one another. So to touch somebody say, I'm going in that, I'm going there, and you're going too. Tell them. Say, I'm going. Now, let me set this, this video up. It's, there's, there's Terry back there. I was looking. So, so you know what? Let me, let me just talk about some things. Uh, Let's talk about ghosts just for a second. Okay, y'all ready? There's no such thing. That's demonic spirits. There's a thing called a familiar spirit that knows you, that may follow you. But guess what? If you have a a spirit following you around, you got angels following you around too. And you got angels protecting you. But a familiar spirit knows how much money I've got in my wallet. Okay? Okay. Now, they will give people, you know, I told the story, I was watching Britain's Got Talent, and the person who won it like three years ago, he had a familiar spirit. He told a girl, he told one of the judges that you said this in the eighth grade to someone who was close to you, and you said mean words, you said these exact mean words, he said the exact words. It was like a pro- pro- prophecy, but it's in the negative. And, and a familiar spirit would know you got $100 in a sock in a drawer at the house. And some will come up and say, the Lord told me that you got $100 in a sock. And you're supposed to give it to me. Well, when God gives you a word, it's confirmation. If it's like, that's new to me, that's not God then. Don't you give them that $100. Now, if you're going like, do I need to give them that $100? Do I need to give them that $100? And then do I need to give that $100? You know what? Somebody who flows in the prophetic will say, You're wrestling with something, and you're supposed to give them what you're wrestling. Yes is the answer. Give it to them. And they could even be more specific and say the $100. That's pretty cool. But it's always confirmation. So so what is all this? You know, know, we can have, I believe that we speak things into existence. And how many times you ever been, uh, there was a, uh, Juju Road when Brittany was in high school, and everybody said, we're going down Juju Road. We're going to see that. We're going to see that ghost. They were believing to see a ghost, and a lot of them saw him. The devil was obliged to manifest himself to you. Okay, just saying. And so I know people that have seen wagon trains go by, trains come through their house, the doors open, the this and that happens. Come on, cast that stuff out. Take authority over that in the name of Jesus. Okay? And then start looking around, see what kids brought in. They brought something in. Because the spirits attach itself to certain things. Magazines, movies, whatever. I'm just saying that because here's the thing. God can do anything and God can reveal himself to encourage you. And he can even show you, give you a dream or a vision of a loved one encouraging you on. In Hebrews 11, it says that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Okay? We're surrounded by witnesses. You know, our loved ones are watching and cheering us on. And for us to walk in faith, to live for God, to to go and be bold. Are y'all with me now? So, so, but God encourages us. You know, Jesus went up on the Mount of Transfiguration and who showed up? Moses and Elijah. And they encouraged him. I know a pastor whose sister died and he believed for her to be healed. She got healed, but five years later or three years later, she died of it. It came back and he was mad, <clears throat> mad at God, mad at himself. And the night before he did the funeral, he had a dream and he saw her in heaven talking to Jesus. It was very, very comforting. And as he walked up, his sister turned around and said, hey, I know you was praying for me, but look where I'm at. Isn't that cool? So God gives us things. So 
Anybody ever watched the Waltons other than me? Remember John Boy? John Boy did a show about the miraculous, about the supernatural. And he did several different things about the supernatural. And one was Terry and Donna's mink daughter was, was uh, in a train crash and she passed at 18. And, uh, and th- th- he did, they did a story about it. And he said, this, this story proved to me that there's a God, proved to me that, that the supernatural is real. So we're going to play this for you. We've got 10 minutes. And so just relax and watch this video right quick. There are hundreds of thousands of people in the world dying of kidney, liver, and other major organ failure who might live if they could find a donor. But the lists are long, and often the organ doesn't arrive in time. When it does, it's a miraculous gift, the gift of life from one generous, caring human being to another. In 1990, Mike Moreno, a 47-year-old carpenter, was diagnosed with hepatitis C. By 1995, his liver was rapidly failing. I really slowed down, and it got to the point where everything hurt. Everything that I did hurt, and it exhausted me. His doctors sent him from his home in Hawaii to one of the world's best kidney centers in (laughs) Dallas, Texas. When I arrived, I was in such poor condition that the doctor took one look at me, and he put me into the hospital. Mike, I'm going to want to admit you tonight. Mike's only hope for survival was to find a suitable organ donor. His wife, Sandy, moved into a nearby apartment for the families of people waiting for organ donations. He was in the hospital three and a half weeks. And during that time, they came to us twice and said, we think we have a donor. And twice they came back and said, not suitable. Sorry. By the fourth week, Mike's condition had become critical. He was running out of time. Doctor came in late afternoon, took one look at me, and he said, It looks like we're going to need to get that organ tonight. And I'm thinking to myself, Gee, you know, (laughs) tonight, huh? You know, I've been waiting all this time. No, not tonight. Without a transplant, Mike would be dead within hours. And then they received a call. It was about 8.30, and the phone rang, and the coordinator said, we have a donor, and the the surgery will be tomorrow morning. morning. Thank you. Sweetie, they found one. Uh They found a match for you, sweetie. That night in Dallas, a huge storm caused flooding in the hospital's basement, putting the elevators out of service. Mike had to be carried down 12 flights of stairs for his surgery. And so I followed him down the stairs to the second floor, and I kissed him goodbye, and it was like he was gone. All I could do with him was wait. Sandy bought a newspaper that day, but was too nervous to read it. She decided to keep it as a memento of the day of his surgery. Mike did very well. I think he's going to be okay. (laughs) Okay. The organ was... But when Mike regained consciousness... He was unable to move. They had determined that Mike had had a rare occurrence happen to him, similar to having a stroke. The pain was the worst part, and it felt like I was on fire. It took me a long time to figure out that I wasn't really on fire. I used to even call my wife and say, you know, I don't think I'm going to make it. Hello? I'm not going to make it. I was so tired of the pain. Sweetie? Finally, I got to a stage where I was just so worn out that I finally just passed out. And that's when I went into this really, real deep, deep state. And the next thing that I recall is that all of a sudden, I'm wide awake and I'm down inside my body. And I can see my organs. And I can see that they just wanted to stop. And I said, yeah, it's okay. Go ahead, you can stop. Just as when I said that, this light expanded on my right side. And out of this came the face of this cute young blonde girl. I know you can do it. And she starts going, now hang in there. 
I know you can do this. Just hang in there. And I'm thinking to myself, who's this girl? And she keeps on going. Don't give up on me now. Come on. I know you can do this. And I said to myself, yeah, I can do this. Yeah, she's right. And I just looked around and I just went, oh, wow. After his vision, his recovery was steady. He just kept getting better. And then they said, you know what? I think you can go to the apartment and stay there. I took him there and we were sitting in the living room and I said, would you like to see the paper for the day that you had your transplant? Sandy handed him the paper she'd saved as a memento and almost immediately he saw a familiar face. Oh. I said, this is the girl I saw. This is her. This is the one in my dreams. The girl in the picture was 18-year-old Tina Mink, killed in a tragic accident the day of Mike's surgery. Tina was a high school senior and the loving daughter of Terry and Donna Mink. Tina was a very happy, outgoing, friendly person. She was just a bundle of energy, a bundle of love. She was very giving. That was her character, that was her nature, that was her heart. Well, from the time Tina was about 10 years old, she wanted to become a doctor. And I remember asking her, why do you want to do this? And she said, because, Mom, I want to help as many people as I can. And so from that point on, she began to volunteer at the hospitals. I'm going to be a doctor. She was just an irrepressible person. Once she got an idea in her head or a goal, there was no stopping her. She turned 18 November 24th of 94, and she had her driver's license changed to show that she was indeed going to be an organ donor. She said, Dad, you know, it'd be kind of strange. I can't imagine any doctor not wanting to be an organ donor. You should be willing to give the ultimate sacrifice that if it took your life to save theirs. Bye, Mom. Bye, Dad. Tina left her parents' home for the last time on May 5th, 1995. Moments later, a train crashed into her car, killing her instantly. The organization Life Gift assisted in donating her organs. Uh, the letter we received from Life Gift several weeks after Tina's death indicated that Tina was able to help over 50 people with her donation. And we'd wondered, well, will anyone ever write us? Will any of the donors ever try to contact us? That's what you wonder as a donor family. Will you ever hear from one of the people that is living because of your daughter? Just say thank you. After months of wondering whether he should contact her grieving parents, Mike Moreno sat down and wrote them a letter. He said, I just want you to know that I'm so grateful for the gift that Tina and your family has given to me. Just receiving the letter for a donor family is a gift you can't explain because you get the opportunity again to realize you, that this is correspondence from your daughter. The two couples agreed to meet at a conference given by Life Gift, the organization that coordinated the organ donation. And when we walked out to meet them, and there was all these people, it was like there was only four people in that room, just us four. We saw them coming in from the side of the auditorium, and it was just like we all just started crying, you know, all at once. Mike handed me um, a bouquet of roses, which were Tina's favorite flower. And then I handed him a photo of Tina. He looked at Donna and I both and he said, I've got some amazing things to tell you about your daughter. I saw her and she's okay. And we were stunned by the remark. Mike then told them about his vision. He said, she was like a little cheerleader, just, you know, egging me on, go, go, go. You, know, you can do this, you can do this. In fact, what was so unique about the way Mike said this, don't give up on me, don't give up on me, is because that's what she would do at all the softball games. 
So they called her the team's little cheerleader. And so we just <laughs> thought that was the funniest thing because she could be very bossy, you know, whenever she wanted you to do something. <laughs> it sounded just like her. Although Tina only lived 18 years, she did accomplish all of her goals. She wanted, more than anything else, to become a medical doctor and help as many people as she could. And she did that. She became a doctor. She just did it in one day. I don't know what else to call it except a miracle. I think the miracle is the fact that a brilliant young lady was taken from her family. But she lives on in many people and in the hearts of everybody she's helped and in the hearts of all the people she knew. I go through some really difficult times because I miss her so much. But I, I do know that I will see her again. Bye, Mom. Bye, Dad. And that's my encouragement to go on. And she encouraged him. You know, uh, I, I was reminded too of Keith Moore, great pastor, Bible teacher, that his dad passed. And it upset him so much. He was flying an airplane, and his dad was in the back seat, and his dad passed away. And he's like, God, why didn't you tell me we could have done this? And if I wasn't flying, I could have done CPR. And he was upset, but he had a dream. And he went to heaven, and him and his dad walked, walked through heaven. And his dad's encouraging, but his dad also gives him a prophetic word. How's the church in Florida doing? And he goes, I don't have a church in Florida. Well, he does now because of the word his dad gave him in heaven. So let me say this. The Bible teaches us not to chase these things, but you know what? God will give you encouragement if you ask him. We're not to go to soothsayers or hand palm readers or try to contact the dead. The Bible just teaches don't do that. But God can give you dreams and give you visions and give you help to heal your broken heart. Amen? So the last one is uh, number three. Christians have victory in death. You know, in 2 Corinthians, uh, the fifth chapter, it's all about victory over death. We should have victory in every area, but even victory over death, even though it's the last enemy to be put down, we can have victory over death. You know, the Bible talks to if you go home and challenge you to read it. Uh, it starts off that Jesus saw, or his 12 disciples saw Jesus, and they all stood. You know, and one, one detective said, you know, you, he said, I've interviewed people who robbed a bank, and nobody can keep the secret. He goes, these, he said, you said, somebody breaks down and then they start telling on one another. He goes, but these 12 disciples, they never backed up, even though they were crucified, cut in half, sawed asunder, whatever. They never backed up. He goes, it's real. And then there were 500 who saw Jesus, it says in this chapter. 500 people saw Jesus ascend. And none of those denied that Jesus was the Son of God. None of those denied that he didn't just ascend up into heaven. They saw the angels and everything. And so the whole chapter is dedicated to, for us, too, to know that if he's risen, so are we. Let's read 2 Corinthians 5, 6. It says, so we are confident knowing that while we are at home in this body, right here, we are absent from the Lord. That means that his spirit lives in us. We have contact with the Holy Spirit, but we don't have contact with Jesus, and we can't see the Father. The only person that saw the Father was Moses, and he glowed for a month, Okay. And he's just saw the backside. But when we get to heaven, we'll be able to see the Father. Isn't that awesome? And so, for we walk by faith and not by sight. That's why right here, right now, I don't have to see Jesus. I've never seen Jesus, but I don't have to see Jesus. Because I know he's real because his spirit is on the inside of me. I have contact with his spirit. Even though I've never seen, I walk by faith and not by sight. Verse 8, for we are confident. We are confident that when we're absent from the, uh, we're confident, yes, well, please, rather, uh, to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Lord. There's no soul sleep. There's no, you don't stay in the grave. When you pass, you go right to heaven, believer, or you go down from believers. That's why we need to tell everybody we know they need to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 
But it's, 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 you don't hang around and, and be ghosts like on TV or whatever. You pass from this life to the next instantly. And, and yeah, you, there, you may be here for a moment or two because I know people that, 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 that died but came back. They saw the doctors or, or I tell the story about the fireman who, was, who got so hot, he was, his suit was melting. And they sprayed him down with a hose and it killed him instantly. And he started going up to heaven. He looked down and was like, man, what are they doing? Oh, they're working on me. And they did CPR and he started going back down. He goes, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Because he had such peace. And such peace, the Bible says, peace that passes understanding. Here, here's one for you. Uh, I heard a story of someone who hung himself. And they died and instantly <coughs> in death. They regretted it. They were brought back to life, but they knew once they died that in that moment, there was so, such regret that they killed themselves. You know, there is life after death, and I want you to settle that in your heart that Jesus is Lord of your life, and you accept Him that you don't have to be afraid to die. You can go to heaven. I've seen many people past and I've seen many people go to heaven and, and be there to comfort and talk to them and tell their family that we know where they're at. The Word of God. I gave you uh, three different passages of Scripture. And let's finish. We're confident, yes, uh, well pleased rather to be absent from the body to be in the presence of the Lord. Psalms 116.15 says, precious, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Because He knows you're coming home. You're coming home to be with Him. I'm sorry, it's 1 Corinthians 15 that I challenge you to read. It says, O death, where's your sting? O grave, where's thy victory? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor, labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let me close with this. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said to this woman, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And he says, do you believe this? So I'm going to ask you, do you believe that? Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Going to live forever. You decide where. Let me say this before I ask you if you want to accept you. Hell wasn't made for you. It was made for the devil and demons. But people go there because they reject Jesus. Not because they're an alcoholic or not because they're a thief. Not for any sin. They go there because they do not accept Jesus and his shed blood. That's how simple it is to accept Jesus and have him wash you and, and, and wash all your sins away. But people will preach this and that, and you won't have this. Well, you know what? If you're an alcoholic, you're not going to have the kingdom of God here on the earth. You're going to live a miserable life. Your liver's probably going to fail. There's consequences to sin. You drink and drive, there's consequences to sin. But hear me, it's accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you've done that, smile. Because you go into heaven. Settle it today. Don't be afraid. You know, I'm worried about what she's thinking about me. Well, if I'm not worried about dying, why am I worried about what she's thinking about me? Or what they think, or what this one thinks. You know what? It's what God thinks. And God the Father sent His Son to die on the cross for you. And salvation is the beginning of it all. Narrow is the door. Right there, it's narrow. It's Jesus. But once you walk through, everything is available. Everything is available. God's wisdom, God's life, God's love, God's peace, God's joy, God's strength. Everything's available. Will you bow your head? Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I'm asking, will you accept Him? It's between you and God. I'm just challenging you. The Bible says, how will they know unless someone's sent? Unless a preacher preaches. 
Well, I'm preaching it today. And I'm asking, will you accept him? Will you allow him to wash away your sins? Will you give him your life and let him make you Lord? Because see, salvation, along with salvation comes deliverance, healing. He wants to set you free. We'll talk about that some next week. But will you accept him? Are you going to be like the the atheists and the agnostics that I read, you know what, I don't believe there's a God. Well, on their deathbed, they said there is a God. Will you lift your hand? We're going to pray a prayer. Just lift your hand. You're committing to God. I see your hands. I see your hand, your hand. Anyone else? Come on, we're going to settle it today. We're believers. Oh, let's pray with them. If you're, st- if you're here and you didn't raise your hand, you just pray this prayer. This is how you receive Jesus. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart. So say this with me. Say, Father, I believe that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Forgive me. Come into my life. I receive you as Lord and Savior. Help me to live for you, to make you Lord for the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus, I ask and I pray. Amen. Look at me real quick. If you raise your hand today, we have a table over here with a couple of our care team uh, leaders uh, they will pray with you. They have gifts for you, books for you. Maybe you're, not, maybe you're unsure. You don't need to be unsure about your salvation. Come on, the devil will just rock you back and forth. Don't let him rock you anymore. If you prayed that prayer, you're saved. I believe. Everybody say, I believe. That's pretty much it. I believe that Jesus died on the cross. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Now I want to live for him. See, see quit chasing what's the world what the world has to offer. Let's start chasing Jesus. Amen? And so go over here. They have gifts for you. They want to pray with you. And it'd be awesome if you did that because it will help you. It will help you get ahead in life and know who you are in Christ. Amen? Thanks for listening to the Sermon of the Week. For more information about Legacy Church and other resources, visit us online at LegacyFamily.info.